نحمده و نستعينه و نستغفره و نستهديه و نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا و من سيئات اعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له و من يضل فلا هادي له و اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له و اشهد ان محمدا عبده و رسوله ثم اما بعد السلام عليكم Uh, as always, it's a great honor and a great privilege uh, to be with you, you know, on these Monday evenings. Um, we've been reading uh, this book entitled Sacrifice, the Legacy of Our Beloved Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's just a compilation of hadith about the struggles and hardships of the Prophet, Alayhi Wasallam. And um, today, I was thinking that we could read from uh, this book and discuss some of the meanings contained therein, or we could have more of an open discussion. You know, sometimes I was telling somebody that speaking on Zoom is much different than meeting with, um, you know, students uh, uh, physically, uh, because speaking on Zoom tends to be much more unidirectional in terms of the flow of information, energy, um, creativity, whereas meeting physically tends to be more bi-directional. Um, I'm giving and I'm also receiving. And I do miss that, that space. I do miss uh, listening to people's questions, listening to their ideas, their insights, because it's from those that I'm able to go into uh, the library, look for different answers, um, questions provoke, uh, thoughts which you know uh, you know lead research so if uh, somebody wanted to open with something uh, I mean of course I have the text it's right here before me don't want anyone to think that I don't I have the text it's right here before me uh, but if anybody had anything that they had been thinking about or anything that they wanted to discuss or anything that they wanted to uh, place before the group for all of our uh, benefit, I'm, I'm offering them the floor, uh, Bismillah. And this is something I need this. So Bismillah, you know, what's 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 on folks' minds? I'd like to know. Oh, wa alaikum salam, rahmatullah, ila Fransa. Nubalighu salamuna ila Fransa. We send our ah. The book is entitled Sacrifice, the Legacy of Our Beloved Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a compilation of hadith about the struggles and hardships of our beloved Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it's by Tamim Ahmadi. Mm, does anybody have anything? Ismail, you can just you can just unmute. You don't have to type in the question. If somebody has something, you can just unmute and ask the question or make the comment. I'll start with something. Bismillah. Bismillah. Um, someone sent me this quote today that I thought was pretty thought provoking. So I thought I'll, I'll share it with you if you want. It, it may be a kind of controversial topic. So I apologize. Not the topic itself, but um, it's a quote from the actor, I'm gonna have to leave the screen and I'll read it to you. It's a quote from the actor that is starring right now in the Rami show. Um, hold on to a second, I'm gonna grab it. Mm -hmm. He's he's being interviewed, Mahershala Ali on, you know, on mm -hmm. why Islam is the key to acting. So that's the article. Mm -hmm. But I really, I really thought this was interesting, this part of sort of what he said. He says, that's not my horn, just FYI. No, no, that's, that's, that, that, that's someone, that's a car alarm outside my house. <laughs> okay, okay, so he's, he's this is an interview where Rami is interviewing him. Mm -hmm. And he says, we talked before about the spiritual struggles you had early on in your career over doing certain things you didn't think you should do on screen. This is Rami asking Mahashila, how do you come to terms with that? And he says, if you look at Judaism, Islam, maybe some versions of Buddhism and the Sikhs, anytime anyone is hardcore practicing those faiths correctly, it feels like anything outside the faith is haram. But as you move further along, as you embrace the faith, 
get more comfortable in it and understand how you identify as a Muslim. You're always examining your relationship to anything secular, anything outside of your actual faith. If you grow mm. up Muslim, you probably have more of a natural barometer for what slacking off means for you. That middle ground where you're okay not following something to the T. And he mm. says, embracing the tenets of Islam that say you will be held accountable for all your actions, that you will be credited for all your positive actions, you will essentially be called out on all the things you knowingly did wrong. You begin to examine your work, entertainment, storytelling, and anything outside of your faith. And you have to strive to bring that into alignment with not just your religion, but with how your religion informs the way you see the world and what is okay and what is not okay so that you can have peace. So what I thought was interesting about this is like, I've spoken to a lot of my friends that are born Muslims. And even before I converted, just to say, it's, it's hard, I think, for converts to know you know, what, how, at least at first, like how comfortable you are in your faith, you're, there's, you know, we're not, we're imperfect beings. So we're imperfectly practicing all the time. Mm -hmm. So for example, mm -hmm. you might be laid on your prayer. You might be, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're doing that isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. And, and just sort of understanding how you live your life. Like I've always said to my born Muslim friends, like how much more, how, how much I think it's easier for them to feel sort of comfortable in terms of I'm still a good Muslim or I'm a Muslim or I'm comfortable with what I'm doing that may not be completely perfect, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's in, it, there's a, a, an easy, an ability for them to be in the gray area. I think at least I felt that way. That's a little bit mm -hmm. harder for converts, especially in the beginning, you know, you'll like that confidence, I guess. No, it's a very, mashallah, first off, I want to, um, commend you for offering such a powerful uh, quotation from Mahershala. And then I want to acknowledge um, his insight and his brilliance and also his yeah. eloquence, uh, the way that that idea was expressed. Uh, and I think it's largely true. I think people that have more experience with Islam as a lived reality are much more prepared for what I would call selective amplifications and suppressions of certain aspects, of, certain aspects of Islam. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you know, you're much more prepared to like. You know, there are some people that kind of understand that. You know, my religion is um, a set of beliefs, tenets, and also uh, actions. And there are certain things that for me are part of me sustaining my own religious identity. So mm -hmm. like lots of Muslims, it's like no matter how uh, they might be struggling in their practice, you won't find them eating pork or you won't find them, some of them, uh, drinking alcohol mm -hmm. or some of them, you won't find them uh, dating, some of them or you won't find them, right, right? I think it's like this, because of my lived experience with the religion, and I'm not denying any of its tenets. I'm not denying any right. of the, mora the moral standards to which I know that I'm being held, but for my own religious identity, right? Um, I would only begin to feel like I wasn't a Muslim or I, I, I you know, I would only begin to feel like um, my own understanding of my commitment is being jeopardized if I stop doing this. Yeah. Or if I began doing this. Whereas I think, you know, for converts with much less kind of um, real experience, there is almost no separation between kind of the... Uh, the, the written material and the classes and everything that we're kind of imbibing and absorbing and learning and a lived experience with Islam. There's almost no, no line of demarcation between those two, you know, so that uh, a person could feel pretty good about their Islamic practice and they could feel that, you know, they're making some headway and they're beginning to, you know, um, you know get some, some consistency and then they could attend a lecture 
or read something and feel like, oh my God, I'm a terrible Muslim. Yeah. Just, like, <laughs> just, just read like, oh my God, we're like, what, what's going on with me? And I think uh, a lot of that, and this is, you know, subhanAllah, I'm going to say something that could get me in some trouble. Okay. I, I think, yes, you know, conversion uh, to anything is uh, phenomenal. And I think we are captivated by conversion because it entails such an intensely intentional commitment to something, right? However, I think we don't realize that being reared in a particular worldview, being reared in certain basic understandings of oneself and the world, I'm not gonna say, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mentioning these kind of in comparison, but it's just much different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know. One of my teachers told me, and he was he, he was uh, Pakistani. He said, "There's a guy right now in Pakistan that um, is sitting in a cafe, um, vaping, right, smoking an argila, that only goes to the masjid." Um, uh, on Salat al Eid, he only goes to the Masjid for Eid. Um, um, doesn't read scripture, doesn't attend classes. Um, but if you were to ask him, Are angels real? Are jinn real? he would respond without hesitation in the affirmative, Absolutely, <laughs> you, know what I'm saying? you know, it's just like. That is very much a part of just the worldview uh, with which he lives, right? He said, and you could have a European or an American Muslim, very learned religiously, um, you know, conversant in kind of, uh, you know, Islamic discourse, attends classes, attends lectures, very intentional relationship with their worship. And if you were to ask them the same question, they probably, uh, I guess, or, you know, you know, it's 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 kind of speaking to. There's a difference between, um, you know, a very strong intentional commitment to something, and a commitment that is kind of like pre-rational, because I don't know anything besides, you know, this kind of un basic understanding of myself in the world. And um, I think it's important to look at the benefit of both. You know, I look at like my relationship to Islam and my children's relationship to Islam. It's very different. You know, it's very different. Um, I, I, you know, there's some things about you know my children's because uh, all of my children were you know um, grew, are growing up you know practicing Islam. There are some things about um, their understandings and and just innate feelings about Dean that as a convert, I feel, you know, lacks a certain intensity, lacks um, a certain personalization. But then there are other things that I envy about them. Like, wow, this is just for them as natural as breathing. It's just as, um, you know, as regular to them as anything else. So I think, yes, I mean, there is certainly some benefit in that very comfortable, natural relationship with Islam. And there's also very great benefit in that intentional, um, uh, very conscious relationship with Islam, you know. So I see, I see, I see good in both uh, dispositions. You know, in terms of trying to resolve some of this conflict for, you know, converts, I think it's about, you know, reflecting on Allah's name, Arab you know, the, the, the Lord, uh, but Rab comes from the same root as Tarbiya. It means to nurture something, to develop something, to cultivate something, to grow something. And, you know, um, it's very common in the Christian community uh, to say, uh, God is not done with me yet. God is not done with me yet, you know, this idea that we're all uh, in states of growth. None of us um, is kind of this finished composite, that's all she will ever be. 
but we're all in states of growth. And I think the secret is being able to appreciate where you are, no matter where that is, especially if you've been blessed to have faith and then being intentional about trying to improve, trying to increase, trying to enhance uh, your faith. But I think you have to be appreciative at all times uh, for where you are. I think that's very important. If you grow um, contemptuous you know, of yourself, if you look upon your own religious practice uh, with a kind of disdain, it might not simply be disdain for yourself. It might be disdain for the faith you know, that you have. And faith should never be treated with disdain. You know, I might be uh, a Muslim that you know, only prays a couple of prayers every day, um, but, and I should hold myself accountable, right? At the same time, to, to, to recognize the significance of those prayers, you have a great many people who don't make those, mm -hmm. you know? But I think that comes from seeing your acts of devotion as, 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 as signs of tofiq or, uh, or divinely facilitated success that, you know, some of us have been given more than others, but I'm thankful to God for what I've been given, you know? Uh, and then just, you know, trying to grow and being patient with yourself, you know? Uh, there's a lot written about patience. And they say, just like you have, you have to have sabr with ta'a, you have to have patience with obedience, right? And patience with obedience entails being patient when you're obeying God even if you encounter difficulty. But they say there's also patience with disobedience. And the patience with disobedience is being patient because one might not be able to rid themselves of disobedience immediately. Does that mean you're going to give up? Sometimes we have to be patient with Malsia. Like, you know, this is something that's very hard for me and I'm going to keep striving. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm patient with that. And I hold myself with some mercy, uh, to quote my, my good friend, Micah Anderson, holding myself with some mercy that I'm doing the best I can, or perhaps I'm not doing the best I can and I'd like to do better, but this is what I'm doing and I'm prepared to work uh, from here. And I think that if you lose the ability to do that, it could be a sign that maybe you're losing some of that personal dimension of your relationship with Allah. Mm -hmm. And that that relationship is now being mediated through, um, you know, something else, right? It's being mediated through something else. And I think those other things are definitely there to inspire us. The tradition, the sharia, the, the you know, all of the, the studies and the books. But those things will never be intermediaries between us and Allah. You know, those things are there to inspire us, but at the end of the day, it's me and my Lord. Uh, and and, and uh, although some can walk this path with me, no one can walk this path for me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and, and also to just reflecting on the mercy of Allah. You know, uh, a, good, a, good, a good, one of my favorite teachers, said that he was in Egypt one night. He was, it was late at night and he was in uh, Egypt and he walked down a dark street and he saw an older man come out of a building holding, uh, shall we call it a malt beverage, but it wasn't a non-alcoholic malt beverage. And he said that he looked at the man and just almost instinctually, he just said, Astaghfirullah. And he said the man looked at him with just this penetrating look, like he felt like the man holding the alcohol was looking through his soul. And, and the man said, Allah ghafoor, Allah is forgiving. He said, Allah ghafoor, he said, Allah is forgiving. And my teacher said that those words went all the way through him to his core. And he just walked away and prayed for that man. And he remembered feeling that the man is clearly engaged, you know, in an act of wrongdoing. 
But even in his engagement with that wrongdoing, shaitan has not disabused him of a good opinion of Allah. SubhanAllah. Shaitan, he hasn't allowed shaitan to disabuse him of ha having a good opinion of his Lord. Now, of course, there are details. You know, one can uh, worship Allah with tool and amal, with hopes that are too long. You know, uh, the, the spiritual masters talk about, you know, if you're a person that takes poison and then takes an antidote and takes poison and takes an antidote, what if one time you take the poison, you're not able to reach the antidote, right? So it's not, it's not to, it's not to um, make light of disobedience, but even if we're engaged in disobedience, know who Allah is. Allah is Rahim, Allah is Rahman, Allah is Ghafoor, Allah is Ghafar. All of these are attributes that indicate the forgiveness of God and to hold out hope in spite of my weakness, in spite of my shortcoming, for that hope is sometimes a radical act. And I think that um, you're right and Mahershala is right. I think people that are born um, um, into you know, Islam are sometimes able to hold that space um, much more easily you know, than, than I think those of us who converted to Islam. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, the, the last thing I'll say about this, it just came to my mind as I was, as I was concluding, is that, and this is, this is really, really controversial, but sometimes I think, like, you know, I used to, um, you know, I used to attend um, church, and I decided that I wanted to be baptized on my own at the age of 12 or 13, I can't remember. So I was always curious about religious things. You know, I was always curious about religious things. But in all of my exploration of Christianity, attending Bible study, attending Awanas, which was a Christian youth group, I never encountered anything that even remotely resembled like a Sharia like these like very hard like rules and prayers that had specific times and you had to orient yourself to Mecca and dietary restrictions and um, uh, yeah, I never encountered anything like that. That was, that was perhaps the biggest shift for me uh, in becoming a Muslim was leaving a very simple morality. I think that the most complex my moral code uh, got as a Christian was like, just be a good person. That's exactly right. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> just, just, just be a good person. That's what I, you know, just be good, man. You know, just be good. You know, funny story, you know, funny story, funny story, funny story. Um, and I would, I, I would only share this with this group because this is my favorite group and with you because mashallah, you're my sister. You know, when I when I first became Muslim, I used to go to the masjid with my girlfriend. <laughs> you know, I used to go, you know, I'd tell you, look, just you know, just sit over there. I gotta run in and pray real quick, babe. Just give me a second. I'm coming, I'm coming straight out. <laughs> and uh, and I used to, you know, walk around Muslim spaces, my arm around my girlfriend, see people. I had no idea that. <laughs> This was something that was disapproved of. I had no clue. I had no idea that this was that 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 the Muslim community would even look askance at this was shocking to me. So one day I was in the mall, and this was a mall that I used to frequent with my girlfriend. Walk around and you know, I'm in the clothes, she's in the clothes, we're in the clothes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, walk around the mall and you know, look at stuff. And I used to see there was a Muslim brother that owned uh, a kiosk in the, in the mall. And I would give him salam, walk up to him, introduce him to my girl and tell her about, <laughs> you know, you know, we have, you know, you know, you know. Hey, babe, this is one of the brothers that I pray with, you know, at the, at the mosque. His name is uh, Wafiq. 
And, uh, you know, this is like really what I was doing. And so <clears throat> only maybe this brother was mashallah, mashallah. May Allah raise him, elevate him, and make me anything like him. Amen. He saw me, he saw me many times after that. He never said anything to me about that. Just would greet me, talk to me. One day, maybe a month and a half, two months after getting to know him and us building some rapport, he started talking to me about commanding to good and forbidding evil. He said, you know, this is an important part of our faith, commanding to the good and, and speaking out against things that are bad and also giving advice to people that you love. He said, but you have to know how to give advice, right? He said, you have to know how to give advice. He said, so if you saw someone doing something that you knew to be, you know, wrong or inappropriate or haram or whatever, and maybe they didn't know, how would you talk to them? And I was like, oh, I would probably come up to the guy and you know, I gave my little spiel. He said, so he went through a number of scenarios. And in the middle of the scenarios, he said, so if I saw a brother um, spending lots of personal time with a woman that you know he wasn't married to, and I was worried about him and I was worried about her, right? How, how would you suggest that I address this? And I just said, um, maybe you could talk to him. <laughs> yeah, I just said, maybe you could talk to him, right? And then only then did I did I, I go back and ask people like, is there something wrong with dating? I mean, I mean, I, I understand that we're you know abstinent sexually, but is there something wrong with just dating outright? And then I had people tell me about khalwa and seclusion and being alone. And it was I had never encountered anything like that. So coming into Islam, I think for us we sometimes cultivate a relationship with Islam more than we cultivate a relationship with Allah, right? We, we tend to think about our Islam as being defined by rituals. So when we, we think about our Islam as like this, um, you know, this set of restrictions and commandments that I have to uh, fulfill. Um, and, 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 and this is not altogether a bad thing, but sometimes we're cultivating more of a relationship with those rules than we actually are with our objective in adhering to those rules, which is to, which is to worship God. Mm. And one of the things that I, I, I recommend there is dua, making lots of dua, you know, we came from a background in which, you know, the only prayer we knew was dua. You know, we didn't know, you know, we didn't know any other kind of prayer mm -hmm. except to speak to God with what was on your heart. We didn't know anything else. And, um, you know, we began, you know, learning about ritual prayer and wudu and facing the qibla and we're trying to recite Arabic and, and you find that some of us were not really making dua the way we used to when we weren't Muslim. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and I think that you know one of the ways that we you know build on you know that relationship with God and not just ritual is making dua, making dua, and not in Arabic, not you know from Imam Al Nawawi's Tadkira with different you know formulas of remembrance that you've committed to memory within your own voice, mm -hmm. speaking to Allah in your own voice, you know, uh, in an idiom that you're comfortable with. Just make sure that there, of course, it, you want it to be reverential because you're speaking to Allah, right? But in your own, as you would speak to God with reverence and with, you know, presence. And, and I think that, that prevents a lot of that, you know, because you're, you're, you're still building on that personal relationship. And this is what I think the Prophet, peace be upon him, meant when he said, that, that personal prayer is the core, the essence, the quintessence of worship, mm -hmm. right? So I think, you know, we have to make lots of dua 
so that we can we can continue cultivating that personal space with Allah. And I, I hope that helps. And, and you know, and I think being in support of each other as well, you know, talking to each other about you know uh, these realities because we are doing something um, you know very challenging, you know, in converting to Islam. Uh, but inshallah, very rewarding, inshallah, both in this world and in the, in the next, inshallah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, other things? Inshallah. Man, you guys are quiet today. Usually, man, this I, I can count on my Monday class to have lots of interesting insights, questions, ideas. I just saw that Omar Uddin came in. He usually always has a really good question. Or Rehan. So no one has any questions. Maybe I should go into the text. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you one last chance. Going once. Going twice. God. Bismillah. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Oh, do we have a question coming on? Yeah, some shake. Uh, uh, Junaid here. MashaAllah, it's good to hear from you. Huh? Uh, just like with all, with, with, with we have everything a lot going on. Um, and um, what, what are some ways spiritually even more on top of just the normal prayers and Quran that um, we can try to calm ourselves down more? And... Um, and find more peace and all, uh, but but still, but still uh, take everything as critical, very important, and because mm. it needs our full attention. But mm. um, and how do we just not, yeah, try to go from from A to B, just like have smooth transitions between each. Bismillah. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was never he never divorced uh, the world, which is. Um, you know, a very important, I would even say critical aspect of his uh, way is that he never, he, he didn't practice a spirituality that was divorced from the concrete realities of the world. In fact, he sought his spiritual realization through dealing with those concrete realities uh, in a God-pleasing way. However, retreat, is not the same as running away, right? Even, you know, it's interesting. You have a, a really cool parallel in uh, kind of how Muslims deal with battle with like an external foe and how Muslims deal with battle with the internal foes. You know, a tawalli fi yom zahaf, like turning one's back when, when evenly matched against, you know, an attacking oppressor, like running fleeing not that one is you know uh, materially disadvantaged in battle but just running out of pure fear is something that is haram in islamic law just running out of pure fear allah says in surah tawbah unless you're running as a means of strategizing so that you can come back and re-engage and the same thing is true within our spiritual lives running just indefinitely, just I can't deal with this. I'm going to abandon my children. I'm going to abandon my family. Um, I can't deal with this. I'm just, I'm just going to become uh, a hermit. I'm just going to move into a cloister. I'm just going to build a cabin at the edge of the woods and stay there and never come out. Many people would say, this is not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said, La Islam. There is no monasticism in Islam. But if one withdraws for a time, just to regain your equilibrium, just to, to settle and to breathe and to strengthen what is necessary internally, to go back and re-engage uh, your responsibilities to your family, to justice, to your community, uh, to re-enter the conversations that are taking place now. That kind of retreat is not only okay, but perhaps necessary. You know, one of the best things that we can do, 
especially in a time like this, when it seems like everything has gone mad, is spending time in nature. Because one of the, one of the uh, <laughs> dopest parallels is that as we're running around frantically um, trying to uh, redefine, and redefinition perhaps is necessary, but redefine our society, trying to have honest and earnest conversations for the first time in since maybe the 1960s, some of these conversations about race and class and equity, nature it isn't even aware that any of this is happening except when, there, when, 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 when nature is experiencing catastrophe because of what we're doing. So spending some time in nature, listening to the birds, watching the flora and fauna of the creation, it has a calming effect on the nafs, on the human soul, right? Things are just so calm there. Just spending time in unadulterated, unbothered, natural environments, right? Just like, even if you just do it for two days or a week, just spending some time settling down, but not so that that becomes kind of an escapist fantasy, but rather just to recenter myself so that I can actually speak to a situation that's increasingly chaotic with some sense of calm, with some sense of purpose, with some sense of um, clarity. So the first thing I would recommend is unplugging, man. Unplugging. You know, many people close to me, uh, especially now, they're getting off of social media. You know, they're, 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 they're narrowing down, you know, causes to which they want to give uh, with their resources, uh, with their time um, that they want to lend voice to. And then they're staying off of uh, social media. Um, they're not doing as much, you know, uh, news reading because all of this can produce a deleterious effect on our hearts and our minds that really debilitate us, man. You know, uh, you know, it's it's one thing to learn of how um, challenging the odds appear to be. It's another thing to imbibe so much bad news that you come to deem the odds as insurmountable and you begin to develop very cynical views of humanity. You begin to develop very cynical views of humanity. And you know, we wanna protect our hearts uh, against that. So the second thing is, is unplugging. And then the third thing, and I left the best for last. Seek aid and support through prayer and patience. Right, the first thing is patience. That's the end of the sub. Seek help with patience, with patience, you know, so that one does not fall into despair. One does not become impatient. One does not become anxious. One does not become dissatisfied. One doesn't fall into the bottomless pit of malcontent, right? And then if you can keep yourself from those negatives, reinforcing your state with prayer, praying to Allah. You know, it's um, mentioned in the tafsir of the Quran that when Abraham and, and the, the Quranic stories are simultaneously true and archetypical, right? So they're, simul they're true. We're not, we're not saying that there isn't, um, you know, truth to the stories of the Quran. But we're saying they are emblematic, they are archetypical, they are representative of realities that aren't limited to what happened in the story. So Ibrahim السلام, was flung into a fire, right? Heat, 
burning, you know, a burning sensation, heat, anxiety about death. I mean, when we think of horrible ways to die, ways in which it would be uh, horrible to die, for many of us, um, uh, burning to death would be near the top of the uh, list, um, I'm sure. Um, but in the middle of that fire, Ibrahim is what? Cool and peaceful because Allah made the fire. Kuni be barad than salama ala Ibrahim, cool and peaceful for Abraham. So that whatever your situation, if God gives you stillness and gives you calm within the situation, you will have calm and you will have stillness, even if that means that you're in the middle of a fire with calm and with stillness. And it's believing that and it's praying from your depths in earnest for that stillness, for that calm, for that peace, which is not uh, in any way divorcing the responsibility, the reality of acting you know, effectively uh, and, um, and consciously, but that I can do so with clarity. You know, there's a, um, there's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that when the Sahaba عنهم, were on their way back from the battle of Badr, every time they crossed over a valley, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> every time they crossed over a valley, they would scream, at the top of their lungs, Allahu Akbar, right? And the Prophet والسلام, came to them and said, you are not calling upon one that is distant and cannot hear you. There's no need, this, this kind of exuberance is not necessary. And then the Prophet والسلام, said, and don't be energetic, don't be enthusiastic about fighting. Don't be enthusiastic about fighting. But if you are forced to meet your enemy on the battlefield, be steadfast. So we shouldn't be, uh, you know, even when we have to engage in, you know, battles figuratively, right? Figurative battles. You know, we shouldn't do so with kind of the, uh, the Prophet والسلام, used to refer to it as the zeal of jahiliya, hamasatul jahiliya, right? The zeal of jahiliya. No, no, always with the equanimity and the equipose of faith, which does not mean that we don't engage with intensity and passion, but it's a measured intensity and a measured and a reflective passion, right? A reflective passion, right? cool, but engaging steadily. Uh, and, and, and it's worship that helps you to acquire that equal pose, that, that equanimity, that equilibrium, that balance, that poise. And um, when a situation is difficult, this might be uh, the most that can be hoped for. You know, I hope that helps. Shukran, that was great, Shaykh. So do we have anything else or do we have time for some reading from the text? Boss lady, what time is it? Okay, so we have about 40 minutes left. So I guess we can do some reading from the text, inshallah. Ibn Abbas narrates in a long incident regarding a plot made by the idolaters against the Prophet ﷺ. When the Messenger of Allah وسلم, departed from them, Abu Jahl said, O oh, people of Quraysh, indeed, Muhammad is adamant about cursing our religion, disgracing our forefathers, belittling our ideology, and insulting our idols. I swear by Allah, I will ambush him tomorrow with a large rock with a boulder. 
when he goes into prostration, when he goes into sujood, I will crush his skull. After that, let the clan of Abdul Manaf do about it whatever they want. So in the morning, Abu Jahl took a large rock and waited in, in ambush. The Prophet وسلم, came and began to pray between the two corners of the Kaaba, the black stone and the Yemeni corner, because his habit, because it was his habit. He would pray in the direction of Sham, the direction of Jerusalem. This was early in the prophetic uh, uh, mission. So he would pray toward the Levant. Meanwhile, the Quraysh were gathering in their usual meeting place. When the Messenger of Allah وسلم, prostrated, Abu Jahl lifted the rock and walked towards him. But once he drew near, he suddenly retreated, frightened, his face drained of all color. His hands turned stiff, due to which he dropped the rock. Some of the men from Quraysh got up and asked, what is wrong with you, O Abu al-Hakam? He replied, I went to him to do what I told you. But when I drew near, a menacing camel blocked me from reaching him. I swear by Allah, I have never seen the likes of its head, neck, or teeth. And it was about to devour me. This is in the seerah of Ibn Hisham, seerah al-A'lam al-Nabuwa. Excuse me. So in this hadith, we learn many things that are, mashallah, worth commenting upon. One is being mischaracterized by your detractors is par for the course. The Prophet the Prophet alayhi wasalam, he never cursed their religion, nor did the Prophet ﷺ ever curse uh, what they worshipped. Because Allah says in the Quran, لا تصبوا الذين يعبدون من دون الله فيصبوا الله عدوا بغير علم Allah says, do not curse the deities that they worship besides Allah. Because if you do that, فيصبوا الله عدوا بغير, فيصبوا الله عدوا بغير علم they will curse God just to retaliate, right? Don't do that. So the, this, so this is Abu Jahl completely mischaracterizing what the Prophet ﷺ was doing in Mecca to begin with. He was never cursing their God. He was never insulting their idols. He was just worshiping Allah. And we learn that the Prophet ﷺ was literally risking his life when he went out to the Kaaba to pray to Allah. That his life was literally in danger. That there were very serious plots, serious attempts on his life. This is what the Prophet ﷺ was referring to when he said, نَحْنُ مَعْجُرَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً we, the assembly of the prophets, we are the most severely tested of people. We also learn that it was the Prophet Sallallahu belonging to the tribe of Abdul Manaf that insulated him, or at least provided him with some modicum of uh, security. So that even as Abu Jahl was preparing to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ, he knew that there might be some retaliation from the clan of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So this also indicates that the Prophet ﷺ did not suspend his tribal loyalties, right? That it was still expected, it was still a part of the agreed upon norm 
of the political milieu that if they attacked the Prophet والسلام, they should expect some retaliation from his clan. The majority of whom were not Muslims, right? There's also uh, a very profound lesson in that when we're thinking about affiliation, we're thinking about allyship, that the Prophet والسلام, still enjoyed the protective umbrella of Quraysh, even though uh, he and they were opposed on religious grounds. He was still one of them. And we have to, you know, especially those of us uh, that belong to, um, you know, white American communities, black American communities, uh, Latino community, Latino American communities, that our Islam, especially in our attempt to engage our people, is not something that should unnecessarily drive a wedge between us and them. We also learn uh, in this hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Prophet والسلام, in many ways. Now, of course, the, uh, the, the, the camel that Abu Jahl saw as he went to approach the Prophet والسلام, this was something within the ghaib. This was not something that anyone else uh, could see. This was something that only he could see. And Allah protected him you know, in that way. Now you actually have many instances, many vignettes from the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, in which he was protected in this imperceptible way by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a notably light security detail. The Prophet والسلام, did not walk around flanked by bodyguards. Even though he knew there are attempts, uh, uh, there were attempts you know, on, his, on his life. Um, in one hadith, we learned that you know, there was a man um, named Mm, let me think of this, think of this companion's name. Bismillah. Mm. Ah, I want to say Doroba, but not Doroba. I forget, I forget the name of this companion, But he was so this is when the Prophet was in Medina. Right? Similar story. And then we'll come to the question. He was so aggrieved. He was so angry. He was so frustrated with the civil unrest being generated by the message of the Prophet ﷺ. For him, it wasn't that he had a, 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 a particular hatred um, of Islam. It was just disrupting the status quo. It was just interrupting the prevailing order in a way that he did not like. And he was sitting around with some of his friends and he said, this Islam thing is bad for families. It's bad for business. It's, it's, it's bad for our reputation. I'm going to walk on foot to Medina. I'm, I swear to you, I will find Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I, I will assassinate him. I'm going to kill him. And he took a dagger and he soaked that dagger in poison. So this was him you know, really arming himself that I'm going to strike him with a mortal blow. If the blow does not kill him initially, the poison in which the dagger was soaked will kill him because of its prolonged effect on his body. And he did that. His name was Dufur ibn al-Haritha. The name just came back to me. His name was Dufur ibn al-Haritha. And he got to Medina and he just asked somebody, where's Muhammad? 
This is how light the security detail of the Prophet was, He just said, where's Muhammad? And somebody pointed to a tree. And they said, there he is right there. Uh, he's, he's, he's just reclining, just relaxing under that tree. And Duthur approached the Prophet with his hand on the hilt of the dagger. And as soon as he got near the Prophet the Prophet rose with a calmness that startled Duthur. And he said, Ya Duthur, bi madha tu haditu nafsak. He said, Duthur, what are you saying to yourself? And Duthur said, nothing. And he said, Duthur, what are, what are you contemplating in this moment? And Duthur again responded, nothing. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Istaghfirillah. Seek God's forgiveness. Did you not say to people in Mecca that you were traveling here to kill me? And Duthur was shocked at the tanabbuhaj of the Prophet والسلام, that Allah had revealed the plot of Duthur to the Prophet والسلام. And Duthur was then startled. These were the, some of the imperceptible ways that God would protect his messenger, right? The Prophet ﷺ then put his hand on the heart of Duthur ibn al Haditha and he started praying for him. Right? See, this is prophetic. This man traveled to Medina with a poisonous dagger that he intended to stab the Prophet with. The Prophet rises to his feet and he does not command his execution. He does not command him to be jailed. He does not strike him. He prays for him. He put his hand upon the heart of Duthur and he prayed for him. And Duthur himself, narrating the hadith, he said, before he touched me, there was no one in the dunya more despised to me than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And after he finished praying for me, there was no one in the dunya more beloved to me than the Prophet Right? These are some of the imperceptible ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect his messenger from those that wanted to do him harm. And Allah says, for those who fear Allah, may yattaqillah yarzuquhu min haythu la yahtasib. Whoever fears Allah, whoever has the taqwa of Allah, whoever reveres God, whoever is conscious of God, God provides for them in ways that they can't even perceive, right? So we also see uh, that reality, you know, in this story as well. I saw that there was a question about why did Abu Jahl swear by Allah? Good question. First off, I want to say your nephew is sharp and very attentive if he asked a, a question like that. You have to remember that the uh, Quraysh and most of the Arabs of the peninsula, they believed in Allah as kind of the supreme creator God. But then they had a pantheon of deities that they invoked as intermediaries between them and God. It wasn't that they didn't believe in Allah. They believed in Allah, but then they had idols to bring them closer. And, you know, um, you have to remember that when it comes to worshiping God, most theologians talk about two tendencies that are almost inherently at odds with each other that we want through our worship of Allah. The first is transcendence. We want, you know, you know for most of us, worshiping a God 
that is not of this world, but has control over this world is what makes God worth worshiping. If you could reduce God to something that you could figure or something that was an extension of just your consciousness and that was God's totality, that kind of God would not be worthy of your worship. That's not, I mean, God is transcendent, right? God possesses a, you know, a, a, an aboveness, right? This is what, you know, uh, what is expressed in the statement, subhanAllah, right? SubhanAllah literally means God is above, right? God is glorious. God is bigger than. We all want to worship a God that is bigger than. But if that element of divinity is overemphasized, God becomes an abstraction. God becomes too big or too beyond to have a concrete reality in my life. He's just, it's like God becomes unfathomable. So the other thing that we want is imminence, presence, to feel that God is close, to feel that God is near, to feel that God is real. And the only thing that idolatry does is idolatry tries to realize God's imminence, but it sacrifices his transcendence. See, wants to, see, the thing about idolatry is that God is brought very, very close. There he is right there. That statue is right there, right? That statue is representative of the high God, right? It becomes a reality unto itself. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does in the Quran is he gives us transcendence and eminence in one single verse. When I was um, studying Islam and thinking about converting, it was this was one of the verses that really had a profound impact on me. Laysa kamithni his shape was Sami al Basir. There is nothing like unto him. So it establishes the transcendence. There's nothing like unto him. God is not male and God is not female. God is not up, God is not down, God is not in, God is not outside of. There's nothing like unto him. But he's hearing and seeing. That's the eminence. That verse, for those that really want to worship Allah, as Allah is, that ayah in the Quran is enough. There's nothing like unto him. So he is completely transcendent in his reality. But he's hearing and seeing. So at the same time that he is transcendent, he's also imminent. You see? So the Arab of the uh, Jazeera al Arab of the Arabian Peninsula, they, they believed in Allah, but they did not embrace his transcendence because they wanted his imminence. And so they sought that, that closeness through uh, the practice of idolatry. So when you hear one of the members of Quraysh, invoking Allah or, or, or swearing by Allah is because they did believe in Allah, uh, but only with um, intermediaries that they, they worship to get closer you know, to Allah. And one of the uh, prophetic aims of the Prophet والسلام, is to demonstrate that this is not, this is not necessary. God is close. Allah is closer to you than your aorta, than your jugular vein. So you don't, you don't need any kind of idol uh, to get uh, close to Allah. Allah Ta'ala says, فَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ دَاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِي If my servants ask about me, indeed I'm close. I'm close. I'm near. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ دَاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِي I answer, I respond to every person in prayer that calls upon me. Every supplicant that calls upon Allah, Allah responds to him. So it was kind of that, that, that adjustment of their understanding of the reality of God.
that the Prophet ﷺ was there to promote. Uh, but it wasn't that they did not believe in Allah. Um, the other point about that, and this is particularly relevant for us because we live in a context in which spirituality is seen as the opposite of materialism. So it's like to get outside of something material, we, 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 we reach for something spiritual. But we forget that the Arab of the, of the, of the Quran, they were spiritual. They believed in jinn. Um, they believed in the daughters of Allah. They believed, some of them believed in angels. So it's not enough just to believe in a metaphysical or immaterial reality. It is also to worship Allah as he is to be worshiped and to believe in Allah as he has commanded us to believe in him. See? Other questions? And Allah knows best. Other ideas. Bismillah. <clears throat> uh, Ranna, what, what time do we have? Uh, 6.42. We're getting okay. close. We have a few more, a few more minutes. Bismillah. So this is another hadith uh, narrated by Abu Hurairah. He narrates that Abu Jahl, Abu al-Hakam, once asked, does Muhammad have the audacity to rub his face in the dust in your midst? Someone replied, yes. So he said, by Allah and al uzza if I saw him doing that, I would surely trample upon his neck or bury his face in the dirt. So when the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, began praying, he approached him as he was in prayer, intending to trample upon his neck. SubhanAllah thinking about the contemporary relevance of that, right? That's, that this is exactly what happened to George Floyd. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. <clears throat> However, he abruptly turned back on his heels, protecting himself from something unseen. Someone asked him, what is the matter with you? He said, indeed, between me and him, there is a trench of fire, terror, and wings of angels. The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then said, had he come just a little closer to me, the angels would have dealt with him. So again, same reality being expressed here, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you know, the physical pain of uh, having someone attempt to stand uh, on your neck is perhaps um, worsened by the pain of being betrayed and being opposed by people that were your erstwhile uh, relatives, loved ones, uh, family members. You know, uh, these were people related to the Prophet ﷺ that felt so aggrieved, so frustrated, so agitated by his call to Islam that they almost on the drop of a dime uh, were willing to take his life. And you know, Shaykh al-Sha'arawi, Muhammad Mutawali al-Sha'arawi, uh, the great you know, Egyptian you know, linguistic scholar, he said that, you know, most of their primary concern with the Prophet and his mission was not theological. It wasn't that they thought, oh man, you know, what are the theological implications of what the Prophet is doing? It was mostly social. That if this message gains a foothold, if this message 
becomes uh, widely embraced, what will that mean for our preeminence, our dominance uh, among uh, 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 the tribes of the Arabian Peninsula? Mashallah. Ibn Ishaq mentions that Ya'qub ibn Utba ibn al mughira ibn al akhnas narrated to him the Quraysh once had a discussion with Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. After which he sought out the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to him, O oh my nephew, Indeed, your people have come to me and sought from me such and such, referring to those things they had spoken to him about. So spare me and yourself and do not burden me with troubles I cannot bear. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, thought that his uncle was considering abandoning him and turning him over to his persecutors from the Quraysh and that he had become too weak to support him and stand by his side. So the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said to him, O oh my uncle, by Allah, if they were to place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I would not leave this effort until Allah makes it dominant or I die in its cause. Tears flowed down the cheeks of the Messenger of Allah and he stood up but when he turned away Abu Talib called him back saying come here so the messenger of Allah came back and he Abu Talib said go on my nephew and preach as you wish because by Allah I will never give you up for anything ever this is a very powerful uh, vignette from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. It's actually mentioned in another, uh, in Ibn Hisham's version, this is Ibn Ishaq's version, that they said to the Prophet ﷺ, well, they said to Abu Talib, if, hold on one second, just for that. Najashi, Najashi, sir, I can't hear, sir. Thank you, sir. If it is your goal to accumulate wealth, through this call, we will uh, raise uh, a fund and we will not stop collecting donations until we have enough money to make you the wealthiest member of our community. Which subhanAllah, you know, thinking about that in the light of the, uh, the current circumstance, the Prophet وسلم, if his goal was only the redistribution of wealth, if that was his only goal, this would have been enough for him to stop his call, take the money they gave him, and redistribute it uh, accordingly. But that was not his only goal. We know that part of his goal was the, was the redistribution of wealth. Uh, through the institution of zakat and the encouragement of sabaka and the outlawing of usury, so the the you know economic justice was certainly a Jews on la It was a part impartial of uh, the 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 platform, the prophetic calling, if you will. But if it were limited to that, when they said, if Muhammad wants money. We will raise money and we will give him as much money as he wants. That would have been enough for him to say, okay, give me the money. I can redistribute the, I, I can redistribute the, the wealth and we can pack it in. They said, if his goal is power, we need to have a council, but we'll make him uh, a king. And the Arabs had never had a king. They were only uh, uh, tribes engaged in internecine warfare led by different chiefs. 
And they said, this is unprecedented in our history, but we'll make him, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a sovereign ruler. If, that's, if, that's, if that will get him to desist from what he's doing. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, that's not, I'm actually not after uh, political power. That's not, that's not my exclusive goal in this. And this is also something that must be examined for people that make political power, the sine qua non. And sine qua non is a Latin expression that means the thing without which something cannot exist. For people that make political power, the sine qua non of Islam, the Prophet was offered political power. He said, no, it's not. If that, if that entails stopping the call to Allah, then no, I'm not, I'm not interested in political power. They come to Abu Talib. They, they use his, his, his love for Abu Talib. You have to understand, the Prophet وسلم, had lost many people. He lost his father before he was born. He lost his mother in infancy. He lost his grandfather after that. Abu Talib was not only his caretaker, but someone that he held in extremely high regard. Extremely high regard. So when Abu Talib said to him, when they went to Abu Talib, and Abu Talib then came to the Prophet and said, please spare me of this. Don't, don't do this because it's, it's causing me anguish. It's causing me stress. The Prophet ﷺ started weeping. This is also, this is the difference between an ideologue and someone that is in touch deeply with their humanity. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say to Abu Talib, this is the deen of Allah. If it's causing you trouble that I'm calling to Allah, then you're a kafir. No, he started weeping. This is my uncle, man, I love this guy. He started weeping. Uncle, this is causing you trouble after everything that you've done for me? After taking me in as an orphan, after your caring for me? You know, they said that Abu Talib had a place in his majlis. He had a seat that only he could sit in. And he wouldn't even let Ali, his son, or Ja'far, his son, he wouldn't even let them sit with him in that chair. He would take the Prophet, kind of his orphan son, really his nephew, but he was raising him like a son. He would take the Prophet and put him in the chair. And Ali and Jabba said, we can't even sit in that chair. But you let him, he's not even really related to you. Hamza, his son, he's not even related to you. Hamza was his brother, excuse me. Not his son, Hamza was his brother. But Jabba, Ali, he wouldn't even let them sit in that chair. He would let the Prophet sit in that chair. Right? So to learn that his calling to Allah was causing his uncle stress, anguish, tension. The Prophet started weeping when he heard that. You know, I always pause at that, that part of the story and I said, I say to myself, this is someone that even in his doing what he had to do, he really didn't want to cause anybody that he loved trouble, right? So that when he says, oh, my uncle, if they place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, meaning literally if they could give me the world, I would not desist from calling to Allah until Allah gives this message success or takes my life in the process. And he's weeping and he's about to walk out. But when he turns away, Abu Talib calls to him and he says, hey, come here. And this is like Abu Talib, you know, asserting Ta'al, Ta'al asserting kind of like, look, I'm still your uncle. I'm still your uncle. So he says to the Prophet, come here. And he says, go on, my nephew. Preach whatever you want because I will never give you up for anything ever. Now, the majority opinion is that Abu Talib did not embrace Islam. It's the majority opinion, that he never embraced Islam. But here you're seeing just his love and his belief in his nephew, that I know you to be virtuous. I know you to be truthful. 
and I have deep love for you, even though I can't fully commit to what you're committed to, but I'm not, I'm never going to give you up. So this is a, a, a very touching uh, exchange. And the reason this is mentioned in the struggles of the, the prophet, so this is mentioned, this is, this uh, vignette, this story is categorized with stories that highlight the struggles of the Prophet ﷺ because being hated by your enemies is one thing. Knowing that you're causing any hardship for people that you love is much harder than being hated by your enemies. That's why this hadith comes after the other one. So that Abu Jahl didn't like the Prophet I mean, it's like, okay. But that Abu Talib is saying to the Prophet stop doing this, man. This is causing me trouble. I don't want any of this. I don't want this trouble. And that the Prophet is forced to tell him, I can't stop doing this. Um, but I, um, but clearly his tears indicate that he is very, he's saddened by the fact that this is causing Abu Talib uh, trouble because he wants ease for his uncle. That's actually much harder than being hated by your enemies. Right? But this, <laughs> this is what the Prophet ﷺ encountered um, in his call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So perhaps that's a good place to, to stop. Um, are, there any, are there any ideas, insights, questions? Man, you guys have gone so quiet since we switched to Zoom. So how? Okay, Aranda, what time do you have? Uh, six fifty-seven. So we're okay. We're, 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 we're right at we're right at the uh, time to wrap up, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العصر إن لسان لا في خص إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل الحق وتواصل الصبر سبحان ربي رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير خير لكم 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 لك